Welcome to Peoples and Things, a podcast about human life with technology. I'm your host, Lee Vinsel, an associate professor of science, technology, and society at Virginia Tech. You can reach me with comments and suggestions at leevinsel at gmail.com or on Twitter at STS underscore news. I would love to hear from you. Well, everybody, I've got bad news. A few weeks ago, I lost my job and was replaced with artificial intelligence software. The AI was better than me at reading historical documents and social science articles and creatively synthesizing them into compelling, even humorous arguments. I think what my colleagues liked even more is that when the university would make up some dumb new rule or hired some new vice provost in nonsensical BS, the AI will not eat up time in a faculty meeting to say, this is idiotic, which is what I usually do, frankly. So my colleagues find the AI more personable and likable than me, and that's hardly surprising. And finally, and I think this is what really sealed the deal for the university, the AI is a better teacher. It gives better lectures and more creative assignments, and it is a fairer grader. And more important, when a student is struggling in class, the AI can look them right in the eye in that caring way that says, I see you there. Don't you worry. We're in this together. You're going to make it. I'm going to help you. Just watch. Just watch. Now, you know that nothing I said to this point is true. But do you remember around like 2017 or 2018 when AI hype was at its most intense and news outlets were full of stories about how AI and robots were going to put people out of work, leading to troubling levels of technological unemployment? Journalists kept quoting the consultancy McKinsey, which estimated, among other things, that between three and 14% of the global workforce would be forced to change jobs because of automation by the year 2030. Even though even then, how McKinsey arrived at these numbers was questionable. Now, there were also skeptical voices from the very beginning. And one of them was data journalist Meredith Broussard, an associate professor at the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute of New York University, and research director at the NYU Alliance for Public Interest Technology. Her 2018 book, Artificial Unintelligence, How Computers Misunderstand the World, which we discussed in this episode, was an early piece that questioned whether all of the hype was realistic and examined why and how people had come to place almost mythic hopes and fears on this technology. I feel like when it comes to AI, we're entering a moment where we're coming back to ground. There are many more realistic discussions about what we can expect out of AI over the next decade or so. But if I'm right about that, I think we need to thank people like Meredith and others who gave a kind of counter narrative, a question the way people were talking about this technology. Without this pushback, who knows how much more dizzying the heights of sensationalism might have become and how much more perilous our return to Earth could have been. I hope you enjoy this episode. Get excited. Meredith, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Lee, it is really exciting to be here. Thanks a lot. Um, Artificial Unintelligence is a fascinating book that really covers a lot of ground when it comes to AI in our lives. 
So when you talk to strangers about your book, how do you explain it to them and what you were trying to do with it? The way I explain the book is that it is about understanding the inner workings and outer limits of technology. Uh, and I started writing it because I would, uh, I would go to cocktail parties and people would say, oh, what do you do? And I would say, oh, I build artificial intelligence for investigative reporting. And people would kind of look at me and say, well, you mean you build robot reporters? I would say, no, that sounds awesome, but that is not what I do. And they'd say, well, you mean you make like a machine that spits out story ideas? I would say, no, that sounds awesome. That's <laughs> not really what I do, though. And so I realized that uh, there is a real need to talk about what AI is and isn't. Because mm -hmm. our visions of what AI is are very much colored by Hollywood. Right. Hollywood is our default. When people think about AI and the future, they think about the Terminator or they think about HAL 5000 or they think about her or they think about all of these awesome sci-fi things, which are really, really fun, but are totally imaginary. <laughs> and so what's real about AI is that AI is just math. It's really complicated and beautiful math, but it's just math and it can only do the things that math can do. Uh, which is a really amazing variety of stuff right now. But we don't expect math to do absolutely everything for us. And therefore, we should not expect AI to do everything for us. Right on. Can you give a, a concrete example of how you've used AI in your journalism work? Just so listeners understand, you know, a, a real example of how AI can be used for such work. So there are a lot of misconceptions around AI in journalism. Uh, one of the ways that we talk about AI is that people say, oh, AI is going to transform every industry. And people really like talking about how AI is transforming journalism. And truly, there are some very cool AI projects happening in journalism. But the reality of AI is far more mundane than anybody realizes. And it's also extremely expensive and time consuming. Hmm. And for journalism, it's, it's really useful sometimes. And the other times it's totally overkill and doesn't actually tell us the things we need to know. Hmm. Uh, so one of the things that I built that I read about in the book is a system uh, that I named Bailiwick, which was a system to help uh, investigative reporters to quickly and efficiently uncover new story ideas in campaign finance data. Uh, huh. So campaign finance data is unbelievably complicated. And I, at first, I thought that I was going to use AI to help to detect campaign finance fraud. Like I had all of these grand ideas about, okay, I'm going to like make this transformative system. And then I got into it and I realized that there really isn't such a thing as campaign finance fraud anymore because there has been so much, uh, so much change in campaign finance laws, and especially in the wake of Citizens United, that it's legal to do just about anything in the campaign finance world, mm -hmm. which is its own kind of problem and is not actually a problem that you uh, that you solve with AI or with data science, but it's a problem you solve with policy. Right on. And so what did you find the tool that you ended up making? Was it, um, you know, like, what could you do with it? Were there more mundane things that you could use the, the program to pull out? Oh, yeah, it worked. It was great. Uh, and uh, I used it to find a bunch of stories and other people used it to find stories. Uh, and it was a, uh, I mean, it was a successful project. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that it was not, though, is it was not popular. Huh. Right. So one of the things I read about in the book is the difference between popular and good. Mm -hmm. And so on the Internet, the currency is what is popular. And the way that uh, social media systems and, uh, you know, the kind of preference systems and recommendation engines that we have, the way these things are built is they preference what is popular and they use that as a proxy for what is good. 
Right, right so on. There's a whole yep. lot of stuff out there that's good, but not popular. And there's also stuff that's popular, but not good. Like racism is very popular, <laughs> but not good. Mm -hmm. right? So this, this brings us to one of the essential problems of recommendation engines and of you know, social media uh, automated newsfeed selection algorithms and what have you, is that these systems cannot curate in the same way that the human brain can curate and they can only pick popular, they can't pick good. Mm -hmm. And if we are going to use algorithms to say govern speech, then we have to think about what is good, not just, you know, empirically, but what is morally good, what is good for society. And the algorithms are just not very good at that. Mm -hmm. And when you say that your program wasn't popular, do you mean it just didn't get picked up or the stories that kind of came out of it just didn't, you know, get retweeted? What, what, how was it not popular? Uh, God, I feel like, uh, I feel like you're asking me to explain why I was a nerd in high school. <laughs> we're going to get to that, actually. I do want to hear about how you were a nerd in high school. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let me just state for the record, I was a nerd in high school. I'm still <laughs> a nerd now. It's all good. Um, so what do I mean by it was not popular? Uh, it did not turn into uh, the next uh, amazing revolution in campaign finance reporting. Yeah. Uh, I had enough energy and enough money to build it mm -hmm. and to tell a few people about it, but I did not have enough money or energy to promote the heck out of it. Yeah. Uh, and unless you have enough money and enough energy to run a publicity campaign uh, along with the software system, like it just doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't register. I hear you. I mean, it's your point about costs around AI is is a really important one, I think, because obviously the journalism world and what's happened with the Internet has really been torn apart in the last 20 to 30 years um, in a lot of ways financially. Um, and there's constant struggles for money. So if anything, it's an industry that's undergoing austerity. And now you bring in these kind of high tech objects, where, which are, in fact, quite expensive to get the job done. It just seems like, you know, there's a real tension there. There really is. Uh, and people imagine that using technology is going to make things faster, cheaper, better. Right. Uh, and especially in journalism, like we're used to being able to get freelance writers to work for very little money. Yeah. But the thing is, people who make AI make a ton of money. Mm. There was mm -hmm. a story the other day, I think it was in the New York Times, uh, and it was about a freelance programmer or no, it was about a software developer who built an app for $50 to uh, figure out where there are vaccine appointments available in New York mm -hmm. City. And so the reporter made a big deal about how it was only $50 and why can't the, uh, you know, why can't the government get it together to, uh, to build an app when, you know, this developer just like came out of nowhere and did it and it was just $50. And I saw an analysis on Twitter um, that looked at, okay, what is the actual cost of developing an app like this? Because it's not actually just $50. Mm -hmm. It's all of the time I put in by this software developer who makes probably $200,000 a year. Right. So his hourly is it's like way the heck more than $50. Right, right. Right. And yeah. the software is not particularly robust. Mm -hmm. It has absolutely no support. It makes no guarantees that it works. Like it's just an exercise. I mean, it's a yeah. cool exercise. I totally mm -hmm. support it. And like, yes, I think that our vaccine appointment technology should be way better. Yeah. Uh, it should also be way more usable for say our elders. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that there's a really profound misconception out there about how much technology costs and how much engineers get paid. And so it is not necessarily faster or cheaper or better mm -hmm. to use a whole lot of technology. Yeah.
that's that's a that's a fascinating tension in itself, isn't it? I think that's you know some people call it solutionism, some people call it the technological fix, but it is a kind of mental habit in our culture at this point to assume that we can fix it better with technology. Yeah, yeah, and so it's a uh, it's an idea that I call techno chauvinism. Mm -hmm. uh, which is a little bit different than solutionism in that I think techno chauvinism is about a kind of bias that says that technology is superior to other solutions mm -hmm. that if we can do it with AI, then it's superior to having a human decide something. And yes, sometimes it is great to use the computer, but other times it is not. And so what I argue is that we should think about what is the right tool for the task Sometimes the right tool for a task is a computer. Sometimes the right tool for the task is something simple, like a book in the hands of a child on its parent's lap. Amen to that. Um, the book, especially at the beginning, is also the story of your transformation from being a kind of technological idealist to becoming more skeptical. So, I, I mean, I love the story of your, your kind of travels from your youth to to who you are now so can you tell us a bit about your your kind of young life as a techno wizard oh this is the part where we talk about how i was a nerd in high school that's huh? right <laughs> okay, thank you. uh so i started programming when i was i think 11 i and i had a what did i have i had i think an apple 2 plus wow uh, and it was connected to a small color television, which was a big deal because uh, when I was very little, like people still had black and white televisions, right? So like the mm -hmm. fact that we bought a new color television to go with the new computer was a big deal. Um, and I did logo programming. Uh, logo is the uh, programming language that uh, was popularized by Seymour Papert, uh, the logo turtle. Like the conceit of logo is that you could draw using this turtle, and mm -hmm. I thought it was unbelievably fun, and it was very, very popular in the uh, in the eighties and nineties for like learning the basics of computer programming. And I found out during my research for the book that uh, the idea of using a turtle in logo uh, was uh, was suggested by Marvin Minsky, who is considered the father of artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and was a longtime collaborator of Seymour Papert. Uh, so I think my parents just were very uh, ahead of their time in understanding uh, what the computer revolution would be. Um, they actually had dates when they were courting. They had dates in the uh, computer lab at Penn, they were graduates wow. together. <laughs> uh, and my mom would type my dad's papers and they would like take their decks of punch cards and like go to the computer lab and like run their <laughs> experiments with the punch cards, um, which is very, very cute and kind of romantic. Uh, but also I look at them like, oh my God, that's so time consuming. <laughs> like, whatever <laughs> calculations they did, like I could do that in like less than 30 seconds now. Right, right. So I am I am grateful for the forward march of technology uh, in that regard. Um, and then you went and got a degree in in computer science. Yeah, so I studied computer science, uh, and my career has been like a very love hate relationship with computer science because I I uh, started my career as a computer scientist and I quit to become a journalist, uh, and I quit because of all the textbook reasons that black women get edged out of STEM careers. Mm -hmm. you know, there was nobody ahead of me who looked like me. Uh, there was nobody who I could talk to when, uh, when things got confusing or I was struggling with sexism or racism mm -hmm. in the workplace. And I just, I just quit. Like I was in my twenties, I was very isolated. Like there were no other young black women, mm -hmm. uh, who were, you know, research scientists around me. Uh, and the social forces were just too much. Um, so mm -hmm. I quit. I did uh, other stuff for a while. Uh, and then I came back to technology as a data journalist. So data journalists uh, find stories in numbers. Uh, we tell stories with numbers. 
And we do all sorts of cool things like data visualizations or investigative reporting using technology. Uh, and the thing I like about doing technology inside journalism is that journalism itself is way less sexist than computer science. Because uh, there's just more women around. Is that part of it? Or yeah. do you think it's a cultural thing? No. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it's it's definitely a cultural thing, but it's also the simple fact that journalism has reckoned a little bit with its mm -hmm. uh, with its structural problems and is making positive changes. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas computer science has never reckoned with its structural changes or with its structural problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, the structural problems in computer science around racism and sexism and ageism and other, uh, other kinds of exclusiveness, uh, these actually go back centuries. Mm -hmm. So the gender bias and the racial bias that's inside of computer science is actually inherited from mathematics. So elite mathematics has never reckoned with its race or gender problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and in part, this is the, uh, this is the origin of techno chauvinism because there's this idea in math that uh, as long as you can do the math, then it doesn't matter what, like nothing else matters. Mm -hmm. right? This is the attitude inside elite uh pure mathematics and that's one of the wonderful things about mathematics like you can let your freak fr flag fly <laughs> in math and like if you can do the math then you are totally accepted but when we look at who has been accepted over the years again going back centuries uh it's men it's mostly white men and this idea this bias that it's only the math that matters is is no longer adequate mm -hmm. like it is a gatekeeping mechanism you know as you tell the story in the book about your uh career changes it, it, there's also a kind of mirroring story of your your transformation from say like a technological idealist to really being more focused on the limits and problems of technology um, and I wonder if you, you know, have you thought about like what started that in your life or, or how, how that transformation worked? There was a paper that I wrote in college about the internet and about commercialization, mm -hmm. right? So I was taking a, uh, a graduate computer science class and it was about the future of technology. Uh, and it was with a uh, it was with a famous computer science professor I can't remember whose name I can't remember right now, um, but he was this awesome guy and we were reading all of these really interesting computer science papers, and this was in the uh, in the mid nineties and so, the final assignment for this class was to write a paper uh, about the future of the internet where you had to uh, you had to argue for what you thought the future of the internet was going to be. And I said in this paper that I thought the internet was never going to get commercial, right? Like <laughs> yeah. I thought that when the commercial interests uh, showed up on the web, that the, uh, the net denizens would rise up and say, <laughs> this is not the culture that we want, we want right. it to be democratic and egalitarian, and we're going to push these commercial interests out, and mm -hmm. it's going to be paradise. Uh, and I could not have been more wrong. Mm -hmm. right? Which, so, to be fair to you, I mean, that was not a that was not an atypical thing for net dwellers to think in the 1990s, right? I mean, exactly. Yeah. And so I I think about that often because. I think that was the most wrong I've ever been <laughs> in my life. And like I was working with the best available information. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah, we're often wrong when we predict the future. Uh, this is such a, it's such a human need to want to conquer uncertainty and to want to predict what's going to happen in the future. And we're so often wrong. Yeah. Right? Like we really can't know the future at all. 
mm-hmm. only know the past and you know then like we have to be careful about uh you know what and how we study and blah 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 like all the all the flaws of studying history yeah uh but at any rate when we're dealing with something like technology and it's something that is never been seen before right like in the early 90s we had never seen the web before so we had no idea what was going to happen and so really smart reasonable people can be very wrong Mm -hmm. about what happens with technology i think that's important to recognize and it's also important to look back at the past so now we are 25 30 years into the digital revolution into the internet revolution Mm -hmm. We actually have history now that we can look to. Yeah. And we can look at the ways things have shaken out in the past and we can say, all right, this is probably how it's going to shake out in the future. And so we shouldn't be making these empty promises anymore. Amazing how often we still do, though, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like I got a uh, I got a press release this morning. Uh, that was some company who was saying, oh, well, uh, I wonder if you want to write a story about our automated trucking thing, because we yeah. ran a survey and uh, we talked to a lot of people who said that if they could uh, if they could drive automated trucks from home remotely, then they would be willing to go to college for four years to learn how to do that. And this is uh, this is definitely going to be the future of trucking and people are going to major in remote trucking in college. I was like, what kind of nonsense is this? <laughs> yeah. Like, this is just speculative mm-hmm. claptrap. And it was certainly not worth anybody's reporting time. Like, it is just yeah. empty, empty claims. And such a bad way to use survey methodology. I mean, what are you really asking people about? Yeah, exactly. And the thing is, like, driving a truck is an honorable profession. Yep. And yep. I don't I don't understand at all why people are so excited about the idea of driverless cars or driverless trucks. Yeah. Uh, because it's just so profoundly unsafe. Um, I mean, this was the this was the conversation that uh, that we met over, wasn't it? It was a conversation yep. about uh, driverless cars. And I am. I'm extremely, extremely skeptical. Yeah, well, I was going to ask you about that later, but let's just go there. So, I mean, you know, if there's any uh, recent technology that's been as hyped as much as AI, and I usually put AI in quotation marks because just of how people talk about it today. But if there's anything that's as hyped as AI, it's self-driving cars. And we have, you know, characters like Elon Musk predicting that they're going to like start coming out in real numbers uh, like next year. Um, but I, you know, I think of you as really like an early skeptic of the the self driving car hype moment. So, you know, tell us a little bit about your experiences with this technology, including your own kind of travels in in a self driving car. Well, I am an early skeptic of self driving car technology because I was almost killed by a self driving <laughs> car in the early two thousands, uh, and so I have been tracking since then. Like how often people are saying, oh, yeah, it's definitely next year. Oh, it's definitely next year. Oh, we're going to have full autonomy by 2020. And the number just like keeps getting pushed more years into the future, more years into the future. Yeah. And you can only do that for so long before it's abundantly clear that this is never going to happen. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's one of these bubbles that's actually been like mm, deflating over the last year or so, or maybe even two at this point. Well, I'm I'm glad for that. And if I had any any hand in helping uh, helping that process along, I yes. am <laughs> I am delighted because it is just a huge waste of money and effort. Yeah, I mean, is your own position? Um, and I, I I meant to look up the kind of NHTSA ISO standards around self driving cars this morning and just forgot to. I think it's like there's five levels of autonomy. The fourth level is like mostly autonomous, but the driver has to step in. And then, you know, level five is fully autonomous. Like you never have to touch the steering wheel. In fact, cars wouldn't even have steering wheels. And is your own, you know, is your own position that that's just never going to happen, that we'll never see that? 
the only uh, really effective use of automated uh, driving that I've seen so far is a parking lot shuttle. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, like, we actually already have parking lot shuttles and they have drivers. And one of the nice things about the driver and the parking lot shuttle is like when it's late and your car is parked far away from the stop, like the driver will drive you over to your car. Mm. Uh, So you don't have to schlep across the dark, cold parking lot. Right. So like there are lots of advantages to these human interactions. Mm -hmm. Right. The other thing that we could do with uh, like if we really wanted uh, automated parking lot shuttles is you could have a monorail. Yeah. I can guess what that technology already exists. Autonomous right. monorails, right? We already Autonomous have those. Autonomous monorails. Yeah, we have those. Uh, they have them at, I think, Newark Airport. Mm-hmm. Uh, and OK, like it kind of freaks me out because I am not really excited about being in uh, like in a an autonomous pod with some strange dude late at night uh but you know it exists and it hasn't Mm -hmm. fallen apart yet so yeah uh i was talking to a kid recently about disney world and about the uh about the monorail at disney world uh because i'm i'm a lifelong fan of the monorail at disney world i think Mm -hmm. it's super cool and i thought it was super cool as a kid and I still think it's really fun, honestly. And so I was telling this kid about the monorail and how the monorail used to be the technology of the future. Mm -hmm. Like people used to build monorails and say, oh, in the future, everything (laughs) is going to be on a monorail. And at the Philadelphia Zoo, they had a monorail, too, for many, many years. And it was so exciting to ride. Seattle. Yeah. Yeah. Ride the elevated train around the zoo and see the animals. And it was awesome. But that was really as much as the monorail ever did. Like Mm -hmm. it was good for zoos. It's good for transporting people at the airport, but that's it. And so we don't need billions in development for, you know, the equivalent of parking lot shuttle. We already have that. I, uh, they had one of, I can't remember the company. It was a French firm. I think had these, uh, self-driving, um, uh small buses they're exactly what you're talking about these like small shuttles and i um i took a ride on one here at virginia tech out um at our vtti the virginia tech transportation institute and um it was as buggy as you'd say it was it was fairly new at that point but it stopped several times because god knows what like wind blew through grass or something or there was a (laughs) rabbit off the side of the road you know uh, and it would just like randomly stop. And then, um, you know, I think it was about a year ago, they actually totally stopped tests of this particular shuttle in the U.S. because one slammed on the brakes and people got injured, as you'd mm-hmm. expect to happen. So, yeah. 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 Humans are just better at navigating unknown, uncertain and unexpected situations. Mm-hmm. The computers are really good at patterns at things that are already known. But when you're driving, there are all kinds of things that are unknown. Uh, One of the things I read about in the book is the time that I was driving down the road in Vermont and there was a moose in the middle of the street. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh my God, this like, there's a moose. The thing was huge for one thing. And I had been chatting with my friend And I wasn't really paying attention to what was happening on the road. And then all of a sudden there's this moose and I had to slam on the brakes. And so this was an example of an unexpected situation that I had never planned for, Mm -hmm. but I incorporated it into my uh, mental model of things that can happen while driving. And I am prepared for the unexpected. Mm -hmm. And in fact, after almost running into a moose i've even i am even more prepared for the unexpected to happen <laughs> while driving uh and computers can't do this mm-hmm. right computers cannot update their mental models i mean first of all computers don't have mental models right but computers cannot update their models for things that are totally outside of their previous Mm-hmm. experience slash inputs you know, only humans can 
Only humans are really, really good at that. Do you remember the first time you started being skeptical about our current moment of AI hype? Was was there a moment that you got skeptical or was it really kind of knowing how artificial intelligence actually works and just being kind of like in those cocktail party situations where, you know, the kind of, I don't know, the discourse was like getting unrealistic from from where things are at? You know, I have I have participated in plenty of unrealistic discourse. Uh, <laughs> I uh, I am uh, a, an enthusiastic watcher of sci-fi. I am an enthusiastic participant in conversations about what if yeah. the world worked like this. Mm-hmm. You know, like if you want to talk about the logistics of a robot takeover and like how you would deal <laughs> with the robot takeover or the zombie apocalypse, like I. I have you to my party, huh? Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm happy to participate in those things. But I uh, when we are actually planning and we're actually making policy and we're actually yeah. I uh, you know, just writing for the public or being realistic about what's truly going to happen, mm-hmm. what is likely to happen, then no, it is extremely unlikely that there's going to be a zombie apocalypse. And it's really important to distinguish between fantasy and reality. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, AI hype starts taking off. I don't know. I mean, the big moment might be 2017 to 2018, like right when your book's coming out, like, you know, Google research rebrands itself as Google AI um, AI really comes into the fore. Their second machine age book comes out like a year or two before that, maybe, um, you know, were you just kind of watching this all happen and being like, this is just so far from where we're at. What was your experience of that moment? So I think you're right about the peak being in 2017. Uh, my book came out in 2018, uh, Sophia Noble's book, Algorithms of Oppression came out shortly before that. And uh, then a few months later, Ruha Benjamin's book, Race After Technology, came out. Uh, And so by 2019, we were really firmly into uh, what some people call the tech lash. Mm -hmm. Uh, I prefer to think of it as uh, a more realistic and nuanced discussion around what AI can and can't do Mm -hmm. and a new awareness of the very human problems of bias and inequality that are embedded in AI systems. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think we should also uh, give a lot of credit to the markup, Julia Angwin's news organization, Hmm. uh, which is really leading the charge in new ways of investigating algorithmic inequality. Mm -hmm. Uh, Virginia Eubank's book, uh, Automating Inequality, is a really important contribution to this discussion. Uh, Zainab Tufeki's book, Twitter and Tear Gas. Uh, Charlton McElwain's book, Black Software. Uh, Sasha Costanza Shock's book, Design Justice. Like there's all kinds of great writing out there now that's a little bit more skeptical mm-hmm. and is calling for, uh, calling for people to be more realistic about mm-hmm. AI. Uh, and I'm actually writing a new book. Uh, it's called, uh, provisionally, it's called More Than a Glitch, uh, What Everyone Needs to Know About Making Technology That Is Anti-Racist and Accessible to Everyone. Nice. We'll say a little bit more about that. How are you thinking about that project? So that project comes out of uh, conversations that I've had uh, around artificial and intelligence. Uh, I have gotten very involved in the conversation around uh, race and technology and the ways that uh, racial bias is embedded in every kind of technology. Uh, The easiest way to understand it is uh, the story that is in the film Coded Bias. Uh, And that film follows Joy Bolomwini, who Listeners, you're probably familiar with this story, uh, but Joy Bolomini uh, was an MIT graduate student who was working on a class project and uh, she wanted to build a mirror that would uh, recognize her face and would uh, 
you know, give her an inspirational saying in the morning. And so everybody in the class was playing with this facial recognition technology on the computer and everybody took a turn going up in front of the camera and the camera would recognize their face and say, oh, face detected. And Joy went up and her face was not detected hmm. because she's a woman with dark skin. So this launched a project uh, called Gender Shades that was absolutely revolutionary. Uh, Joy's work and the work of her organization, the Algorithmic Justice League, are an absolute must read. Uh, and Joy audited the various facial recognition algorithms published by uh, the big tech companies. Mm -hmm. People tend to imagine that tech is this uh, space that's full of scrappy startups and there's all this diversity. And that's not at all true. Tech is dominated by the big nine. That's it. And every startup gets acquired by one of the big nine or goes out of business. Like, mm -hmm. that's it. So all of the technology that you're using, it comes back to one of the big nine companies and it's either running on the Microsoft cloud, the Google cloud or the Amazon cloud. Mm -hmm. That's it. Uh, so this is a very important conversation. The conversation about, uh, how facial recognition technology is better at recognizing men than recognizing women. It's better at recognizing people with light skin than people with dark skin. It totally excludes uh, trans and non-binary folks. Uh, and it's not just a conversation about facial recognition, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is not limited to facial recognition technology. Right. It's in every other kind of technology as well. Um, when you register for college classes and there are only two options for gender uh, or when you uh, go to wash your hands at an automated uh, faucet and the faucet doesn't come on because your skin is dark. Hmm. I mean, that's a that's a huge problem. It's yeah. an even bigger problem in the middle of a pandemic, right? Because right. we need people to wash their hands a lot nowadays. And what's the, when it comes to facial recognition uh, technology, I mean, I th there's been a lot of famous cases where the data sets of photographs are just primarily white people. Is that the main problem or, or is there a lot more going on there? There's a lot more going on. Uh, so the easiest fix when you look at a facial recognition program and you say, oh, the data that was used to train the system has primarily white faces or primarily white male faces. Uh, okay, well, we'll just fix this by putting in uh, faces of different pigments. Right. right? We'll put in more uh, women, we'll put in uh, non-binary folks, we'll put in trans folks, we'll put in people with darker skin, like we'll just, we'll fix it. That's not enough. Mm -hmm. Because facial recognition technologies are disproportionately weaponized against vulnerable communities, against communities of color. Mm -hmm. So the real solution is an abolitionist solution. The real solution is let's not use these technologies and let's especially not use these technologies in policing because these technologies are going to harm black and brown communities, are going to harm poor communities. Right, so if I hear you uh, correctly, what you're saying is it's not just how we build these tools, it's how we use these tools. And just given the way things are in the United States with our inequalities and racist realities, we're going to use these tools against uh, black and other brown people for the most part. So let's just not do it at all. Is that right? Exactly. We, yeah. we really need to challenge not only how the tools are built, but whether the tools should be built or should be used at all. Yeah. And it's okay to say no. Mm -hmm. It's okay to say, all right, we did an experiment with using automated proctoring software and it was a disaster. So we're not going to do that again. Yeah, but we need to stop making the same mistakes because the the history of technology, especially history of enterprise technology, mm -hmm. is just a string of failures one after the other. 
And yeah. people keep thinking, okay, well, if we just spend more money or we just get different people, like next time it'll be better. Next time it'll be better. And it, it rarely is. It's interesting because when I think about how people write about the politics of technology for the last 30 or 40 years, it's often so focused on the design phase, like design it better. But I think you're, and I'm sure, you know, that we can think of other examples, people, people calling attention to this too. We have to think as much about the context of use, right? Like the politics mm -hmm. of use. Yeah. And also what happens after the technology is out there for a really long time. Yeah. Right. So you accumulate an enormous amount of technical debt over the years and your your program will work well at first and then you'll you'll launch it and then you'll find some bugs and then you'll do another iteration. You'll do another iteration after a few years. It's it's kind of like a, a house where you just keep like adding on pieces of the house without any regard for the overall aesthetics. Like eventually <laughs> you just have to like knock the whole thing down and start over again, mm -hmm. or you have to redesign the whole house from the ground up. Yeah. Um, there's a, uh, there's a part in, uh, in Harry Potter. Um, oh wait, am I allowed to talk about Harry Potter? You no, can talk about Harry Potter. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, it's the Weasley's house in Harry Potter. Uh, and the, uh, the description of the Weasley's house is that, uh, like every member of the magical family just like adds on another thing that they think will be cool. So there's like turrets everywhere and right. like, weird parts like stapled on and, you know, leaning towers and what have mm -hmm. you. And it's a total hodgepodge. And so that's actually what, uh, a software program is like yeah. after a few years, like you have people who are coming in and out of the company and you have different art directors and different product designers and you have different fixes that are uh, that are implemented really quickly because there's some kind of disaster or some kind of security leak. And, you know, every so often you do need to redesign the thing from the ground up. And if you're not going to invest in that, mm -hmm. which is, by the way, a very expensive and time consuming process. Right then it's just going to languish and like it's going to be a big mess after a while yeah which is exactly like every other <laughs> process in the world right every other technology in the world right like roads yeah. or whatever yeah yeah or like your closet for example yeah. like you, you <laughs> yes. have to clean out your closet every so yeah. often and reorganize <laughs> it because like you just shove stuff in there over the course of the year and it gets messy yeah you know, I thought it might be helpful to give uh, listeners like a really concrete example of kind of AI hype and, and, you know, where things go sideways in it. And I was thinking, you know, like a high watermark and maybe a cause of the, you know, partial cause of the chatter around AI was when the, the computer program AlphaGo beat a number of Go masters in the, in the game. And suddenly, you, I think it was like 2015, if I remember correctly, and suddenly you, you, you saw people like MIT business school professors, uh, Andrew McAfee and Eric Brynjolfsson making big projections based on AlphaGo and suggesting that this technology would be used to solve all kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. But if I'm reading artificial unintelligence correctly, I think you're way more skeptical about AlphaGo as a kind of example um, that we can use to make projections on. Mm -hmm. um, so would you, wh why should we be wary of making predictions uh, of the future based on that program? So my, my skepticism is based on historical precedent. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's based on my skepticism about games mm -hmm. as, as indicators of anything except games. <laughs> yeah, good point. Right? So yeah. back in the uh, back in the early days of artificial intelligence, uh, back in 1956, when there was a meeting at the Dartmouth Math Department and the field of artificial intelligence was made incarnate uh, by Marvin Minsky and John McCarthy and some others, uh, they were hammering out what this new field was going to be. And they decided that a mark of intelligence in a computer was going to be if the computer could play chess Mm -hmm. And if the computer could beat a human at chess, mm -hmm. because they thought that smart people play chess. And therefore, if a computer can beat a human at chess, 
the smartest humans play chess. And if the computer can beat the human at chess, then the computer must therefore be smart and mm -hmm. must therefore be smarter than the human. And this is one of the markers that we're going to use for intelligence or, you know, and if we can do that, then it's going to mean that sentience is just down the road. Yep. Uh, and this is what they thought in 1956. And they were wrong because it turns out that playing chess is, is an exercise that is very difficult for the human brain to mm -hmm. compute. But like with modern computing methods, like, yes, the computer can beat any human at chess, even the yeah. best human. But the thing is that chess and being good at chess is not the only marker of intelligence, mm -hmm. right? So that was the big mistake of the early artificial intelligence theorists. Mm -hmm. And so the people who thought that Go uh, was going to be a, a marker of machine intelligence were wrong in the same way because mm -hmm. they thought, all right, well, chess, yeah, all right, the computer beat the, uh, beat the human in chess, but chess, it turns out, is not all that hard. But Go, that's harder than chess. Right. Yeah. Right. And only really smart people play Go. And uh, if the computer can beat the smartest Go master in the world, then the computer will be intelligent and it'll be on the road to sentience. And it was the same thing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. They just kept moving the goalposts. And it turns out that like we have computers now that can figure out the mathematics of go and mm -hmm. we also did this interesting thing uh where the alpha go program was trained with millions of actual go games played by humans right right so there's hours and hours millions of hours of human effort and humans figuring things out that is used to train AlphaGo, mm -hmm. like, yes, the combined effort of, <laughs> of right. like years of humans playing Go can definitely defeat the best, uh, the best human Go player. Mm -hmm. like, that doesn't actually surprise me. But I also don't think that games are, uh, are an indicator of intelligence. Hmm. Like, I think they're just games. I think it's play. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that somebody who plays really well is better than, or worse than anybody else. I think it's just a game. Yeah. And, and also that it's just not a, like, it's not the case that we train up alpha go, you know, to be really good at go. It's not going to be really good at anything else necessarily. Right. Like, it's not like you can go have it play, I don't know, tic-tac-toe automatically. It's going to be great at that. It's not like there's like general learning there. Yeah. And I think the the mistake, the misconception is that games equal general learning. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yes, for human beings, games uh, teach you a lot. You know, you learn strategic thinking, you learn patience, you learn social interaction, and the computer doesn't learn those things. Yeah. It just plays the game by these very narrow rules. Yeah. Right. So we just, we need to think about it differently and just be skeptical about the claims that computational advance X means transformative thing for the world. Yeah. Um, now, I should say that I am extremely enthusiastic about technological advances. Mm -hmm. Right, like I, I love technology. I build technology. I teach technology. I am, I am excited about technological advances. Yeah, I'm just skeptical that it's going to make everything better. Yeah. Uh, another thing about AI that uh, that people are just starting to realize is that it's really bad for the environment. Right, the amount of energy that it takes to train an AI model hmm. is phenomenal it's way more than you would expect that's interesting and yeah. it might actually be a better environmental choice to not use ai have, yeah, yeah to not use ai hmm. 
Yeah, I guess the famous case for, you know, for digital technology and environmental outcomes is like Bitcoin is famously bad at, but you're saying AI also has uh, kind of environmental impacts that people were underestimating earlier. Yeah, absolutely. Kate Crawford has a book coming out about this uh, within the next couple of months. Um, cool. And it's about the environmental impact of AI. And I think people are going to be really surprised and shocked. That's great. Um, you know, within the last year, I don't know, I've seen more articles um, from even mainstream sources like BBC, uh, kind of wondering if the air is going out of the AI bubble. Um, you know, some people say, you know, if we're not entering an AI winter where we see like a massive shortfall in funding for the technology, uh, we might be entering an AI autumn where, you know, there's just lower expectations. Expectations have come back down to the ground or something. Where do you think we're at today with exuberance around AI? I think there's definitely some kind of AI climate change happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we have definitely been through an AI winter before. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of exuberance around AI, uh, up until the 1980s. And then there was a big crash and then people didn't pay attention to AI at all yeah. until, uh, the big breakthroughs, um, led in part by my colleague, Jan LeCun, uh, who had all these breakthroughs in neural nets. Mm -hmm. Um, and that kicked off the current AI renaissance. Um, it's possible we are uh, at the top of a hype cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, who knows? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've just spent all this back. time talking about yeah. like, oh, how bad we are at speculate. prediction. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm not <laughs> sure. Like, it could go either way. Uh, right I'm, on. I'm ready for it, no matter what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Meredith, I always enjoy talking to you. Um, thank you so much for coming on. I'm really looking forward to this next book you're working on. Um, are you st it's still a little ways out, I take it? Yeah, I'm still writing it right now. Right so uh, look for it in like a year, year and a half, I think. Cool. Well, yeah. stay in touch, please. I'd love to have you back on when it comes out to talk about that too. All right, will do. Thanks so much for having me today. This was a great conversation. Really enjoyed talking with you and with your listeners. Thank you, Meredith. I hope you enjoyed this episode of our podcast. Peoples and things like most things in this world depends on the work of many people. I want to thank my brother Jake Vinsel for writing the music for the show. I want to thank my buddy Juliana Castro for designing the logos for the podcast. You can check out our work at julianacastro.co. Peoples and Things is a production of Virginia Tech Publishing and the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. Production activities are supported by the Athenaeum, a space in the library that acts as a hub for digital humanities, teaching, learning, and creation. Joe Fort is the Athenaeum Coordinator and Digital Humanities Specialist at VT Libraries, and he serves as producer and sound engineer for the podcast. For information about other podcasts from Virginia Tech Publishing, visit publishing.vt.edu. I also want to thank you for listening. Thanks. <laughs>